welcome to the flow measurement lab. So today we're going to be taking measurements of volumetric flow rate. In lab two you took measurements of pressure, and so today we're going to do another measurement lab. And this is an extremely important topic that you guys should be familiar with coming out of 1970, because any object in our world revolves around being immersed in some fluid, whether it's gas or liquid. And even if you're not remotely interested in fluid mechanics, it's important to be able to understand how to measure the fluid that's interacting with your object in some meaningful way. So there's a number of different types of flow measurement devices. And I would like you guys to think about them and different possibilities of how to use them. There's a bunch in this lab that we've used already. And we're going to run through a pretty exhaustive list of different ways of measuring flow. So to begin with, flow, in our case, since we're dealing with incompressible fluids, we can be measuring an M dot, a Q, or a V, since they're all related by areas of density, which we, can, which we know. So think about any flow measurement device, any sensor that you can build that would measure any of these quantities. So yellow map. Like a paddle wheel? Paddle wheel? Yeah. Cool. So flow measurement devices. And as we go through each one, we're going to try to list their advantages and disadvantages. So Marco said paddle wheel. And I'm going to generalize that to the turbine, because a paddle wheel and turbine are really the same thing. So there's a turbine flow sensor. And the way that works is you, you take the, the flow energy of the fluid and you translate that into the rotational kinetic energy. And you pick up that with some the velocity, the angular velocity of a shaft moving. And you can back out with the initial velocity for that. So can you think of any advantages of the turbine? Disadvantages. Disadvantage you interrupt the flow. Yeah, so you're probably going to deal with a pretty big pressure drop due to the turbine. So if you did, if you want to have limit or flow going into your object and you're measuring it with a turbine, you might have turbulent flow instead of limit. Um, an advantage of a turbine is that it's uh, uh, it's just pretty foolproof. Like you can use any type of fluid with it as long as you calibrate it correctly. Um, I think they can probably be pretty cheap. Pinwheel, paddle wheel. That's, that's what I can think of. So there's turbine flow sensors, what else? How about a nozzle? Yeah, great. So on your pre-lab, you, you used, how did you use your nozzle to measure flow? Uh, we were given pressures. Great. So we used differential pressure measurement mm -hmm. to the end Bernoulli's equation and mass balance to calculate the flow rate through one part of the nozzle. So the nozzle is actually one form of a differential pressure measurement flow sensor. And we're going to uh, derive the equation that you did in pre-lab more rigorously uh, later on. But for now, I'm just going to list a bunch of different flow sensors. So the nozzle is one. Keep going. Robert, we're listing a bunch of different flow sensors. How, how to measure uh, flow, volumetric flow. I want you guys to get this because, yeah? Take the velocity and then find the cross section layer and then you know the flow. Great, easy. So then you can do it with a ruler and like a stopwatch. Okay, you've gone to something there, but how do you actually mark where the flow starts and ends? With uh, some kind of like particle? Particle, yeah. Great, so we did this in lab. Yeah, I don't know what it called. Anyone remember? <laughs> particle image velocity tree? PIV. So using PIV, where you literally track the position and the time it takes to get to that certain position for a particle. And PIV is, is probably not great to use in a, in best, or in like a, a setup that you're going to be wanting to measure constantly. It would more be like, more for like uh, validating uh, a model, computational fluid dynamics model, or maybe seeing how a drag is affected by introducing an object into a flow. PIV is great. What else? There's two other devices that you've used in this laboratory that measure flow rate. Yes. What's that called? I remember. Okay, that's the variable area flow sensor, flow meter. These are sometimes referred to as rotor meters. 
I actually don't know why, considering there's nothing that's rotating. But the way these work is super clever. So remember, what we had was uh, flow going up through the device, and the float would be would be uh, would reach equilibrium at some level, and then you read off a percentage of maximum flow. So what we had is some tapered tube and some float, which has some mass. So there's going to be some gravity force. And it's counteracted by what? What, what is keeping it in mechanical equilibrium? How, how is the flow keeping it there? A drag force. The drag force, exactly. So in your rocket problem, you were given the drag force expression. Does anyone remember what this is? CD. CD. A. A. It's, it's, it's A, since the flow is going in this direction. It's the frontal area of this of this object, okay? This is general, okay? So this is an important expression to know. It's the drag coefficient times the frontal area times one half, thank you, and, and rho. And then the crucial one that we're going to be measuring is v squared. Yeah. Great. So these are all constants. CD is going to be dependent upon the Reynolds number, which is a function of velocity itself. But we're going to assume maybe for now CD is a constant, which means that the drag force, since it has to counteract gravity, there's only one unknown in this equation, so we can do one half CD AF rho V squared equals MG. Solve for V. And this velocity, since this thing you know is going to be in equilibrium, static equilibrium, this velocity will be known. Given this velocity, we want to find flow rate, remember? Q equals V times A. Guess what? We build this thing so that we know A as a function of Y. So V times A as a function of Y. And if we know what Y is based on the height that we're reading, we can back out what A is and we know what V is since it's going to be in equilibrium, therefore we know what Q is. So these are really, really nice because they're cheap. They're really simple, just glass tube and float. Um, they're good, they have a high dynamic range. You can get, if you make them tall enough, you can be measuring extremely high flows down to low flows. Um, they're, they don't introduce an extreme pressure drop, you know, there is a small pressure drop due to them, but they're pretty cheap and standard. Okay, what other, what other devices do we have? There was one that we took uh, measurements using in lab two. Yeah, you're, you're on the right quadrant of the lab room. <laughs> well, the tube being blown, is that one? No, that was just measuring pressure. Oh, okay. And this one measures variable pressure. You could probably measure flow. You could measure flow. Variable pressure in what way? Well, like you have pressure along. Along the pipe. Yeah, you're getting there. Exactly. So you're on the right track. It turns out that that tube there we don't really know exactly how the pressure re re relates to the, to the um, length. But there's a device that's exactly the same, uses the same principle as that up in the corner called the laminar flow element. And remember that the laminar flow element, you take a differential pressure measurement and you have a calibration curve which relates that delta P to a flow rate. And for laminar flow, that relationship between delta P and Q is linear, which is a pretty cool result that you can drive analytically, which we're going to do, I think, in week eight, maybe in week nine. But to the laminar flow element, which is often referred to as an LFE, so I'll write this over here. It exploits the principle that volumetric flow rate is proportional, linearly proportional to a pressure drop along a pipe, which is pretty cool, I think, if you think about it. I mean, if you have a pipe, you take a pressure difference measurement, the flow rate is linearly proportional to what you measure for laminar flow. Now, laminar flow element requires laminar flow, so what it is is actually a bundle of small tubes in sort of in parallel, if you will. And the fact that they're small tubes is important. Why? Great, so it's to keep it laminar. And you can think about
about this mathematically if you look at the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number, remember what it is? Anyone? Rho V times some length scale. In this case, it would be the diameter of the tube over mu. And so low Reynolds number flows correspond to what? Yeah, which means low Reynolds number is laminar. Yeah. So you need a small diameter to keep laminar flow. So the laminar flow element uses small diameter tubes. It's just a, a bundle of small tubes in that little device up there. So for our laminar flow element, which you can go on online and buy, it's pretty cheap. We have this calibration curve, which for a given delta P, and ours is going to be measured in inches of water, not in pascals, keep that in mind. And if you want Q, which is unfortunately given to us in standard cubic feet per minute, CFM, the curve is perfectly linear with a slope, ours has a slope of 128.57. Okay, so you're going to be using this curve which is given to you to calculate the flow rate through our system. Okay? So keep that in mind. LFEs are cheap, easy to install. Um, they won't work for combusting flows because it's going to be melting the inside of the tubes. Uh, they probably don't work for super high Reynolds number flows because you probably can't reach laminar flow. But they're cheap and pretty standard. Okay. Now, from starting from here, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to come up with these on your own. There is one, however, that you've used on your pre-lab. You derived in your pre-lab. How do you measure flow rate using... Uh, I don't want to give it to you because you just did it in your pre-lab. What was the second question? I'm not going to pronounce it, but the idea would be... Okay, pito. Yeah. Pito. Pito static. Pito static. Exactly. So the pito static tube... Some people refer to it just as a pitot tube, which is technically incorrect because pitot implies you're measuring stagnation pressure. Static means you're measuring static pressure, and in order to get a, a flow measurement, you need both stagnation and static pressure. But you often hear it as just a pitot tube, which is what I'm going to probably use today. So you should probably talked about this in lecture also. Uh, it's a really nice application of Bernoulli's. So it's another differential pressure measurement device. So the way it works is we have this object which is measuring there's a, uh, some sort of a uniform flow out in front of it, and one streamline will come and stagnate right at the this tap, which is going to be the same pressure all the way through it. We're going to measure another pressure, which is the free stream pressure or the static pressure, which has a wall separating the static pressure and the stagnation pressure. And these two pressures, we'll call them P1 and P2, are then measured independently. So you can think of this as having a manometer sitting over here. And vice versa on this side. This is sort of a, oops, just a cartoon of what you would be doing. So let's look at the stagnation pressure first. This is our atmosphere pressure. The line, the, the, the free surface on this side is going to be what? Higher or lower than this line? Lower. Lower, right. Stagnation pressure will be higher, so there's going to be some difference there. Now, I'm not going to go through the analysis quite yet because I want to go through more, but in your pre-lab you did Bernoulli's from some infinity point to the stagnation pressure, stagnation point, and then you should have done the exact same thing from infinity to the static pressure point and relate those two streamlines and you get an expression for V infinity. And I'll go through more about that in a bit. So the pitot static tube is another differential pressure sensor and we're going to be using that today to measure flow rate. So the ones that we're using, I will mark in yellow, we're going to be using the no nozzle, the laminar flow element, and the pitot static tube. And you're going to be measuring flow rate through the pipe using three different methods, and they should all agree. They won't agree perfectly, but they should all agree to within a few percent error. Okay, let's keep going though. There's other types of flow sensors that are super cool and super important. So, I'll let you guys think for a minute about any others. Any 
together. So we're using physical principles to measure velocity. You use a force sensor. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So this is sort of like that because <coughs> you're using the force of gravity. But you can have what's called a target flow sensor, which is nothing more than just a device which is hooked up to a spring, which is being displaced by some drag force. So you have some displacement, and you know what the displacement is, and you know the spring spring constant. You can hook up, you could get what the drag force is, and we said the drag force is one half cd rho a v squared. Back out what v squared is. Cool. Anything else? Anything else that's obvious? Well, there's one that's very similar to the turbine, which actually doesn't use the same exact principle, which would be maybe a, a bucket system. So you can think of having a pin, like a pinwheel that has buckets that you fill up, and when the bucket gets heavy enough, it, it moves, and the next bucket gets filled up. And this, if you know the, the rotational speed of this trolley system, and you know the volume of each bucket, you would directly know what Q is. Yes? The other thing you could do, I mean, if this is very similar to that, I have a bucket. Yeah. See how long it takes to build up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, just plunk it. Exactly the same thing. You, you fill it up. You have some unit. But if you want it to be continuous, you have to move that bucket out of the way to get a new one there anyway. So that's called a positive displacement flow sensor. And the bucket analogy is useful to um, conceptualize, but they're actually used in a little different, different way. I'll show you. Positive displacement flow meter. So what you might have is this is a clever, a clever thing. Some sort of a duct that you could uh, introduce this reservoir in here. And you have two gears that rotate. They're oval shaped gears. They're meshing. And they seal off an outside area here. And so you can think of this as just a volume, like a bucket that's getting filled up and then pushed around out here. And if you know what the volume of this region is, and you know how fast these things are moving, then you know what the volume, the, the volume flow rate is. So that's a positive displacement pull sensor. Okay, other ones. So there's one that uses uh, lasers. This one is very non-intuitive and pretty much magical, but uh, it's called the laser laser Doppler velocimetry, which is pretty cool. Let me see if I can explain it. So what you'll do, if you have two pieces, two lasers that are shining at a point inside the flow. So just imagine laser, laser. Those two waves of light are going to interact. They're going to interfere constructively and destructively and create a fringe pattern. That fringe pattern is going to have some sort of a, a period to it of increased in, uh, intensities. So there's going to be some fringe pattern which hits a fluid particle which you might have to see, so you can see it upstream, or that could have uh, inherent particulate matter in it. And that fluid particle, since it's moving, there's going to be a reflection of, of wave fronts off of it. So if you have a sensor sitting on the side, maybe two sensors, well, let's do it over here. This wave particle is going to be, sorry, this particle is going to be reflecting waves. And the period that you're going to measure over here since this thing is moving will be longer than over here since it's moving in that direction. So we're exploiting the Doppler effect to measure the speed of this particle via the period of wave of the wave, the period of the wave being measured here and here. Okay? So that's cool. There's also a <coughs> flow sensor called the an ultrasonic flow sensor. So sonic implies sound waves. So the way this works is also super cool. There's actually a few of these in this lab. So you'll have a pipe and you have a reflective medium up here. And you're going to shine sound waves off this medium. The flow is going in this direction. So you'll have a wave that goes up and then comes down. These are transceivers that both send and receive signals. So we'll call this signal A, and it's going up and back. And this guy will send one over here and come back here. That'll be signal B. 
and the, the medium in which the waves are traveling is itself moving, which means that these waves are going to be taking different amounts of time to get to the other transceiver. Wave A will be elongated, wave B will be shortened. So the time it takes for wave A to get to the other transceiver will be shorter than the time it takes for wave B. You can pick up that differential time, and then you can back out using calibration what that velocity is. There's, so these are used in heart or in, in surgery oftentimes to measure blood flow through arteries and veins because they don't require access to the inside of the pipe. So you just have to reach, put a reflector on one end and then transceivers on the other end. So this device here is that. So this metal part is a reflector, and then there's two transceivers in the blue portion, and you would hook it around an artery during surgery or maybe for experimental purposes, I don't even know. And you'd measure what the flow rate is that way. So take a look. One more thing is I forgot to send out the, the pitot-static tube. So recall, this is the pitot-static tube. There's a port here for the stagnation pressure. And then there's ports all the way around the side for the static pressure. And these are not mixing. There's a, there's a concentric tube that goes down the middle, which outputs to this one. And this one, you're getting the static pressure reading. So that's the ultrasonic flow, uh, transit time flow sensor. So yeah, ultrasonic transit time implies that it's calculating the time for transit. There's another one called the magnetic flow sensor. So Faraday's law tells us that the electromotive force which will generate a voltage, is perpendicular to both the velocity that a wire travels through a magnetic field and the magnetic field lines themselves. So remember, recall, which I always find amusing because no one ever can recall what you're supposed to recall, but um, the electromotive force F is equal to the charge times the electric field generated plus the velocity of your wire crossed with the magnetic field. So if we think of our water line, or of a, a conducting fluid, which is water, traveling through, this is, this is Faraday's law. This is a vector, obviously. Think of a conducting fluid traveling through a pipe. And think of it as a, a series of wires. Okay, so there's a, a wire that charge can flow down. And that wire itself is moving with the speed V. This v. So what you do, you have a velocity V here. You can generate a magnetic field. You can reduce it. The V cross B, so if the velocity here is steady, then the net force on this wire will be zero. So that can drop. And then we're left with the electric field is proportional to the velocity, I'm going to make this non-vector quantity, times the magnetic field, and then times this length that the magnetic field is acting. So if we know what the electric field will be, which you could measure using a voltmeter, the electric field lines are going to be pointing this direction. So you measure what V, what the voltage is there, <coughs> and you know what the magnetic field is because you've induced it yourself and you know what the length of the magnetic field is, is occurring over because you built the thing, then you can figure out what the velocity is. So these are co cool, they're called mag meters sometimes. Um, they are not intrusive, obviously not introducing anything inside the flow. They only work for conductive media, media. so that's a limitation. Um, that's all I <coughs> about those. There's one more. Has anyone ever taken apart an engine in a car or looked under the hood? Have you seen the like big air intake hose that feeds air, <coughs> usually behind the wheel well up through the engine? Have you ever just looked inside that thing? So there's a flow sensor in there because you need to know how much air your engine is getting before you can decide how much fuel to give it because you want to make ma ma match the air and fuel ratio appropriately. So usually these days you'll get a flow sensor for that, which is called a thermal flow sensor. 
<coughs> and the thermal flow sensor works on the principle of, of heat transfer. So if you know that the heat that's being uh, given to your sensor and you know the heat transfer rate is proportional to the velocity of the fluid, and you can take temperature measurements, then you can back out what that velocity of the fluid is. So these will look something like this, where you have a wire sticking into your fluid, and you apply uh, uh, a load to this wire, which has a resistance. So there's going to be some R squared R heating into this wire. And it's being cooled based on convection from the incoming air. And that convect the rate of heat transfer for that convection is a function of Reynolds number, which is, again, a function of velocity. So taking temperature measurements in this wire and knowing how much heat goes in, and you can back out what the velocity is. Okay, these are oftentimes, they're called hot wire anemometers as one uh, type of thermal flow sensor. That is all that I can think of. What? Oh, the, yes, thank you. One more, which is also super cool, which is the vortex shedding flow meter. So remember in lab one where we did the water tunnel? and we looked at the oscillating vortices that came off the back end of an object. We said that those vortices, the frequency of those of that vortex shedding is proportional to, I don't remember, this is a, a nice question that you could remember. So, you know, the pipe, you induce some vortices via some bluff body here. And there's going to be some period of vortex shedding. And they're going to have an object that allows for, for oscillation. So it might be fixed to some rigid piece here. There's some rotation point, and then you can measure the, 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 the uh, deflection of this object, maybe. And remember the, the Struhol number? Is that from the bell? The Struhol number is this non-dimensional number, which is equal to the frequency of vortex shedding times some characteristic length scale, which might be the diameter of this object, divided by the free stream velocity. So, Struhol number is itself a function of Reynolds number, just like with everything else we talked about so far. But for a large region of turbulent flow, the Struhol number is constant, which means that if you measure the frequency and you know what the d is, you can back out what v is. Okay? So, that is a pretty thorough, rigorous list of flow sensors, which you can now if you needed to build a device to measure flow, you could pick any one of those, and now you know how to do it. So like I said, today in this lab, we're going to be taking measurements using these three devices. So at the end of the lab section, I want you to tell me three numbers, four numbers. I want Q measured using the LFV, and I want them all in meters cubed per second. I want Q measured using the pitot tube, in meters cubed per second, and I want Q measured from the nozzle in meters cubed per second, and I want some percent discrepancy, which is up to you to describe how to, to define how that you're going to measure this. There's many ways. And they should all agree within a few <coughs> Okay, so now let's go look at the setup. Alright, so this is the setup. We're going to have flow going through this pipe here. And the flow is going to be induced via this blower, which we've used before. The blower is controlled with this variable voltmeter. We're going to just turn it on all the way up to high. So the flow is going up through here and then around out the back. We want to measure the flow rate. So we're saying it's going to be constant density at this low, flow, low speed. The Mach number is very, very small, less than 0.3. So we can say it's incompressible, which means that the volumetric flow rate will be the same anywhere in this device. Okay, so the, the laminar flow element is the first one that you're going to use because it's the easiest one to measure. It's this thing. So we're going to be taking the differential pressure measurement across the LFE via this floor manometer, which you guys have used in the past. So you're going to have to remember how to use this. That's one. Second one is the nozzle. This is the nozzle here. And there are pressure taps going from upstream, which is labeled 13. And then the throat is labeled 10. 
So you're going to follow these pressure taps back to the well comparison manometer and then get a reading of the delta P using inches, in inches of water, which you'll need to convert to Pascal's. These are all uh, here in inches, okay? So the scale here is inches. And then you'll use the equation that we're going to drive on the board in a second to go from delta P for a nozzle to the velocity. The third device is the pitot-static tube, this one. So we're going to measure one pressure, which is the stagnation pressure coming up in this tap. And the other one is the static pressure in this tap. And these are hooked up to the slant manometer, which gives you a nice uh, reading because of the higher resolution. So we have four inches displaced over 12 inches. We've seen that before. So you're going to want to calculate delta P for the nozzle, pitot tube, and the LFE. Is everyone clear? All right, so now we're going to derive the expressions for the flow rate through the pitot tube and the nozzle, which you did in the pre-lab. First, let's look at the laminar flow element once again. So just to reiterate here, for the LFE, you are given this calibration curve between Q in feet cubed per minute versus delta P, which is directly read in inches of water. So whatever number you're taking off of that manometer is the x-axis. And the slope of this line, we said, was 128.57. That's the LFP. This should be the super simple first calculation you do. Next, we'll go through the pitot tube. So the pitot tube again has this shape. Two pressure measurements. P1 and P2. We can draw two streamlines. Call this A, B, C, and B. Okay? So we'll do streamline, this first streamline here. We we'll, we'll do Bernoulli's PA over rho plus VA squared over 2. I'm neglecting the GZ term because we're going to be horizontal here. PB over rho plus VB squared over 2. Okay, so PA is going to be P infinity. VA will be V infinity. PB is 0 since we're stagnant. And, uh, sorry, PB is going to be P2 for measuring that. And VB is going to be 0 since we're stagnant. So to solve for V infinity, I still need a P infinity measurement. Rho we know, P2 we're measuring, but I still need a P infinity. So we'll move to the second streamline. So for that second streamline, I'm going to do it down here because it's just one line. I apologize for the cramps, but we have P, C over Rho. Now the velocity here is V infinity. And the velocity here is also V infinity, since we're just passing it right by the tube. Which means that PC over rho equals PD over rho equals P infinity equals P1. So P infinity and P1 are the same thing. The static pressure is the P infinity pressure, which means that V infinity is just P2 minus P1. So this is our velocity in the Vito tube. And we're measuring uh, volumetric flow rate. So to get Q, we need to multiply times A. And I want you to think about which A you're going to multiply times. Don't ask me when we have to do it, because it should be pretty straightforward. And remember that or the, the diameters of the pipe are right here. This D2 is the diameter of the nozzle. D1 is the, out, the diameter of the, of the rest of the pipe. OK? So that's the pitot tube. Now let's do the nozzle. So we'll draw it again. So our control volume consists of the region inside here. We'll have some diameter V1, some diameter V2, and we'll have some V1 and some V2. We want to measure volumetric flow rate. Let's say we want to do V2 times A2. Okay, we can do V2 V1 times A1, but I'm going to arbitrarily choose the throw in the nozzle as our spot we're going to be looking at. So let's do uh, Bernoulli's from 1 to 2. So I have P1 over rho plus V1 squared over 2 equals P2 over rho plus V2 squared over 2. 
We're going to be measuring the P1 and P2. We're going to measure the difference between them. And I want to solve for V2. Okay, so what I can do is I can just solve for V2, but I'm going to need what V1 is in terms of V2. <coughs> so how do I do how do I deal with V1? You can calculate with all the other measurements, but it means that's not I did Bernoulli's first here, which actually goes against my rule, which is always do mass balance so first. Balance. So I reiterate that mass balance is always easy to, it's usually easy to do and it's almost always useful. So what I could have done is mass balance first, since rho is constant, m dot in equals m dot out, but q equals q in equals q out, which means that v1 a1 equals v2 a2, which means that v1 equals v2 times d2 over d1 squared. I'm going to define a quantity beta, which is defined as d2 over d1. So that means that v1 is just v2 beta squared. Okay? Now I can solve for v2 by moving <coughs> rows, introducing v2 for v1, and I'm going to save you the algebra here. And I get v2 is the square root of 2 times p1 minus p2 over rho times 1 minus beta to the fourth. Okay? Now q, we said it was v2 times a2. But I'm making a little bit of an assumption here which we have to think about. Bernoulli's implies inviscid flow, correct? We have a nozzle here in which there is a constriction of flow, and there's going to be some boundary layer over which there will be a velocity profile that goes from zero to the infinity, which means that we can't neglect the inviscid, we can't neglect the inviscid nature of this flow. So in lab two, did I make a mistake? No. Okay. In lab, uh, the water cannon lab, we used uh, something called the discharge coefficient. You guys remember that? C, D, which is actually not the same thing as the drag coefficient, but uh, it has the same nomenclature. And C, D is defined as the actual volumetric flow rate over the ideal volumetric flow rate for a, a pipe or a nozzle or a diffuser or any sort of constriction. And you realize why this is happening, right? So the boundary layer on the edge. And that boundary layer has some non, some velocity less than the velocity in the middle. Okay, so this is equal to V actual over V ideal, because the areas are the same in the actual ideal case. And which means that my Q is actually equal to C D times V2 A2. Where, sorry, I should call this to be explicit, V2 ideal times A2, right? I still need CD here. In the water cannon, we assumed CD was about 0.6. For our cases, we're going to use a more explicit um, ca uh, calculation for CD. And in this lab, we're using a type of nozzle in that's, that's, we use this nozzle because we know it's CD. So, I'm running out of room here, but I'll do it over here. So we're using an ASME, American Society for Mechanical Engineers, long radius nozzle, which has a particular profile. And for this particular nozzle, this particular type of nozzle, there's an empirical relationship for CD, which is 0.9975 minus 6.53 times the square root of beta, which we've already defined over the Reynolds number, it's happening at D1. You guys could have gotten this, right? Easy. Yeah. <laughs> so, in order to calculate CD, I need beta and Reynolds number. Beta is easy because it's just measurements. Reynolds number, what is Reynolds number? What did I say it's just a second ago? It's rho VD over mu. Correct. So, rho, since I'm, I want it at D1, it's going to be rho V1 D1 over mu. Now, V1 and V2 are related using mass balance. 
this becomes rho v2 beta squared times d1 over mu. Now guess what? My cd is a function of v2. So my new, my new expression here is that if I want to find what v2, what, what um, v actual equals cd times v ideal, right? But cd needs v actual. So I can't explicitly solve for v actual. I'm getting mixed up with v2 and v actual, but, but uh, in this case it's explicit. So what we have basically is that, now I'm going to go from v actual to v2, so v2 is the actual velocity, okay? This is equal to some function of v2. And in fact, the function it includes a 1 over the square, square root of, or square root of 1 over, yeah, square root of, imply, it uses some, some non-clean expression for v2. So how do we solve this? MATLAB. MATLAB is correct. Um, I'm going to have to erase all these. So one way of solving it is to simply think of this v2 minus, or sorry, v2 equals the function of v2. And this function of v2 is just cd times the ideal velocity. Move the to the other side, and just get some zero equals f of v2 minus v2, which you can just call some capital F of v2. So now we want to find the zero of some function. And there's a whole uh, calculus of, uh, there's a whole uh, branch of math that involves root finding like this. So some function, this is sort of the left side, if you want to call this like g, This function is zero when the v2 is the actual, is the right amount. So what we can do is we can apply a root finding algorithm, such as the bisection method, where you take two bounds, find their value, realize that they're opposite signs, and you find the middle point, and keep doing this until you converge on the solution. There's Newton's method, where you take the first derivative, draw a line down to the x-axis, find the new value at that point, and then keep doing this until you converge on the solution. And MATLAB is great for this because MATLAB has a built-in command. It sort of does this for you. It's called F0. So if you get time today, you can, you can try to do help F0 and try to do this yourself. It's actually only two lines of code to find the zero this way. But if you didn't know this existed, you could also just do it iteratively, okay? So you could do an iteration. So what we'll do, think about um, this step over here. I'll write that again, so we'll have v2 equal to some function of v2. So the first step you're going to do is you're going to guess a v2 value, which I might guess to be the ideal value first. Using that v2 value, you're going to calculate your Reynolds number, which gives you your discharge coefficient, which gives you your v2 actual, because remember that this guy is just equal to cd v2 ideal. And then your third step will be to compare your guess value to the one that you calculate. And if you don't like that comparison, you just keep going and guess again. Okay? So you're going to work through this today a lot. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to set you loose here, but I'm going to First, I'm going to help you a little bit. The measurements you're going to want to collect for this, you're going to get two values for the LFV. They're going to both be in inches. You're going to get two values for the P2. They'll both be in inches. And you're going to get one value for the nominal. So you're going to be figuring that stuff. And everything you need to know is on the board. Uh, you're going to need a density of air value. I want you to calculate that using the ideal gas law. So you'll get T and P, there's a thermometer on the well, on the formometer, and then the barometer is sitting on a bench over there. So I have two statements before you start on this whole process. One, be careful of units. Two, 
be careful of which density you're using where. With that information, you should be good to go.